Hey everybody, hello patrons first. I am trying something new in terms of interviews. You guys have liked my long form interviews, so I'm trying something different. I'm finding smart people to talk about nerdy things. And we're starting with an examination of the cultural stuff around Shang-Chi and the Ten Rings. And I'm here with a friend of mine. You guys have heard me promote this, this author and editor and historian a lot on Twitch. I plug his book, um, The Moon Under Her Feet, Shrine of the Siren Stone. Uh, but Derwin Mack is also the editor of The Dragon and the Stars, which is a science fiction and fantasy anthology by overseas Chinese. It won the Pre Aurora Award, which is the Canadian version of the Hugos for Americans watching. He also edited Where the Stars Rise, uh, which is an anthology of Asian themed science fiction and fantasy, which won the Alberta Book Publishers Award. So I happen to have a friend who's more than qualified to talk about the issues surrounding Asian diaspora representation in media. So Derwin, thanks for, thanks for giving us your time here. Where, where, me. Yeah. where do you want to start? I'll open it up to you. What do you think is the starting point for people who are sort of, they don't understand why there has been this big, oh, wow, this movie is historic around Shang-Chi and the Ten Rings? Because I, I think for people who aren't kind of aware of just how big a moment this is, they're like, I don't get it, it's a Kung Fu movie. So what's going on here? Well, I think what's going on here is that uh, this is one of the first times, and it, it, this happens rarely in uh, North American media or popular entertainment, that uh, the, the characters, are Asian Americans. And you might wonder, well, wait a minute, there's, there's been Asians in all sorts of movies, right? There's in Kung Fu movies and in sci-fi movies. But these are actually Americans of Asian descent. And, and there's a difference, right? Um, traditionally, if you looked at uh, Asians in science fiction movies or comic books or, or pop culture, they were all foreigners. They, 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 they had funny accents, right? Or, or they you know, came from another country. Uh, uh, at best, they were newcomers who hadn't really learned the American way yet. Uh, and this is uh, this Shang-Chi movie, along with that new uh, reboot of the Kung Fu television series, actually show uh, these Asian characters not as foreigners, but as Americans first, right? Uh, in Shang-Chi, uh, they, they definitely uh, are Americans. Uh, they, uh, they, they speak like Americans. They, they speak English well. Uh, they have regular jobs that Americans would have. Uh, they, you know, they're, they're, they're not invaders from another country, right? And I think that makes a lot of difference in the representation of Asian Americans in, in the media. And uh, that, that's why I, I think uh, Shang-Chi has been uh, so important for, uh, for, for the Asian American community and, and, and as a uh, milestone in pop culture. Now, does this get into the idea of a model minority? I mean, Aquafina's Katie character, there's this one line about the fact she has a degree in something like oceanic biology or something like that, and she's parking cars for a living. I Help people understand this idea of the model minority and how it, I mean, Simu Liu's entire career is about over overcoming that model minority thing. In Kim's Convenience, he was sort of the dumb family member who didn't have a degree, dropped out of school, was working at a car rental. I don't know what it is about him in cars <laughs> in his career, but, you know, they, they do really get on this idea that they are, it's, it's not the safe minority. It's not the model minority. I explain to people what the deal is there. Okay, well, the model minority is this stereotype that uh, Asians are the good minority in America and Canada. You know, they, they don't protest. They don't riot in the streets. Um, they don't mug you and so on. And it was set up in the night. It's, it's funny because for decades, Asians were considered not the model minority in Canada and the United States. They were considered threatening, mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
dirty, evil, uh, dishonest. And then in the 1960s, suddenly mainstream society, that is white society, began to consider Asians to be the model minority. Look, they get jobs, they study, they stay in school, they don't drop out of school, they don't commit crimes, et cetera, right? And if you study how the model minority stereotype emerged, it emerged at the same time as the black civil rights movement in the United States. And it was set up by white people to basically, um, uh, and basically as, as, as a tool to use against black people to say, look, here's a minority group that made it. Uh, why can't you be the same, right? The truth of the model minority stereotype is that it is not really true. Uh, first, the Asian American and Asian Canadian communities are not just one ethnic group. They're split into dozens of them, right? It's everything from Chinese to Tibetans to Japanese to... Uh, uh, Vietnamese, and then even within them, you get groups within groups, like within the Vietnamese, there are the Hmong mm -hmm. uh, people, and then there's the majority of Vietnamese people, so, and, and the Thais and the Koreans and the Filipinos, and you know what, we, um, people have looked at our statistics on, you know, our incomes and our education levels and who drops at school, and it's all over the map, right? Some, some of these people who we consider mono minorities have dropout rates as bad as any other minorities. Some of them are as unemployed as other minorities, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's a stereotype that uh, is, was created in the 1960s to use against another ethnic group. And where does harm, and people come up to me sometimes and say, well, isn't it a good stereotype to have, right? And say, no, it's not a good stereotype to have. First, if it's being, if it was deliberately invented to use it against another ethnic group, uh, that means you're being weaponized and no one wants to be weaponized, right? Uh, secondly, it's often been used as an excuse to, uh, to not hire or not promote Asian Americans on the basis that, well, your group's already had enough already uh, you already benefit a lot enough for uh, you, you don't deserve any more privileges, right? Not that being hired for, uh, for being the best of the job is a privilege, but that's the way a lot of white employers have looked at, use the model minority stereotype against Asian Americans, right? And it's, it's also um, been used to, um, to stereotype actors in roles, right? So, once upon a time, if you were uh, an Asian actor, you usually got the evil villain Fu Manchu type roles, right? Now uh, you're, you're only with the model minority stereotype, uh, you wind up being the extra who's, you know, the university student or the, the, the doctor who gets like one line in the movie, right? And at best you might be the hot, girlfriend from college or the white <laughs> guy, right? So I, I thought, wow, this is really neat. Uh, in, in, um, in, in the Kung Fu TV show reboot that premiered earlier this year, one of the characters is a lawyer, but by no means, you know, uh, a, a hot shot lawyer. She's just an ordinary lawyer trying to eat out of practice somewhere. And uh, and the other characters come from regular jobs as well. And it was kind of refreshing to see uh, Simu Liu and Aquafina playing to, uh, I guess, the uh, car valets at a hotel. Yeah, I, I thought it was interesting as well that they um, didn't put them in any sort of like romantic relationship because that would have made her mother far too happy. Right. Yeah. I, it, w one of the things I've, I've I've talked to with a lot of people, it, it, it's sort of this cross cultural exchange of the breakfast scene with the family and how they're just giving her the gears about there's a man around. What are you doing? And, you know, other friends of mine have been that is so Asian family. I said, hate to break it to you. It's Jewish families, too. It's just the dinner instead of the breakfast. But oh, there was one thing very un-Asian American about that, if you mm -hmm. want to look at the stereotypes, okay. 
if uh, rather than encouraging Aquafina to uh, to marry this this guy, her her colleague at the car park, uh, they probably if if you really want to conform the stereotype, they would have her they would have her, they would encourage her to dump this guy and go after a doctor or a surgeon or. A, which woman. again, some stereotypes translate. It seems to be an immigrant thing, right? Oh, yeah. If if you didn't come over on the Mayflower, these these are the same stereotypes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned Fu Manchu. Yeah. Um, and that ties it like Fu Manchu is sort of the archetypical yellow peril character, mm -hmm. and you you talked before about how the model minority myth came in in the 1960s to kneecap the Black Civil Rights Movement. Before that, there was this yellow peril partially tied into propaganda with World War II. But explain to people what that is, because I find that, I mean, Marvel Comics was very informed by pre-existing fantasy sci-fi kind of adventure serial tropes and adventure serials were very very impacted by yellow peril stereotypes so unpack what yellow peril is and how fu manchu ties in yeah well a uh, yellow peril uh, is this idea that sprang up in the 19th century in the united states and canada that uh, asians were coming over the country and they would do all sorts of hideous things they would take over the country uh, they would end Christianity, they would end Western civilization. Uh, worst of all, they would, you know, marry our white women and corrupt them and so on, right? There's, there's all, do you ever notice that a lot of racial hatred always includes corruption of the white women, right? And, mm -hmm. and to stereotypes of black people as well. Have you ever seen Birth of a Nation, that movie by D.W. Griffith? A lot of that is about you know, protecting our white women from evil black people, right? Yeah. And, and uh, the, the um, yellow peril was the same way. And it, it came about when uh, lots of, of uh, Chinese workers were brought into the United States and Canada to uh, work on the railroads, right? And because there were, as usual in, in North America, when you get a lot of people of a new ethnic group showing up, uh, the, the, the mainstream or predominant culture suddenly gets upset, right? even though they were brought in to build this railroad for the benefit of the mainstream culture. Right? And they get upset. were Chinese immigrants at the time, were they indentured servants? Were they on indentured servants contracts or were they actually just hired contractors? They were hired contractors, right. but at very low wages, right? Which, right. Which that, so they had to keep on working because they couldn't, because if they quit, they couldn't afford the passage back home. Right, much much like the uh, Indian workers that were shipped over to the Caribbean. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. So people people don't realize that there was sort of this period with with the railroad. I snickered because I won't repeat the joke you said at one point that'll stay between us. But it was very very funny, very very pointed uh, at one point. But yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So, so we have this immigrant group that was brought over, much like say. Uh, Guatemalans in the U.S. right now. They were brought over to fulfill a certain labor shortage. They were doing jobs that were low paid and dangerous and nobody, nobody else wanted to do them. All of a sudden they started forming a subculture and now they're dangerous. So that's where Yellow Peril came from, right? Where Yellow Peril came from and uh, Americans and Canadians, you know, got, got scared. And after the railroads were finished, some of these people went home and some stayed, right? And, uh, and, and regardless of whether you, you went home or you stayed in North America, people were afraid of you. If you stayed in North America, you were obviously the vanguard of an invasion. If you went home, you're obviously plotting to invade later on. Right. And, right. Uh, and, and, and both, uh, United States and Canada had all sorts of anti-Asian, anti-Chinese laws. Like you, I, I mean, it's funny. Um, when I went to school in, uh, in, in Kitchener, Ontario, uh, our history teachers would always talk to us about how nasty and terrible the Americans were, but not about Canadian, how, how bad things were here. We, we always gloss over what happened in Canada and try to make our country look, you know, super tolerant, super... Uh, super diverse, super 
you know, well, super saintly, right? Why, well, why do you think that is that people have trouble reckoning with the fact that things actually have gotten better? I mean, things were really rough during that manifest destiny European colonialism phase, but isn't it better that we look back on history and horror as opposed to things not improving at all? Uh, you know what, it, I, I think what happens is, is that uh, actually acknowledging that these past, you know, illnesses had happened in Canadian history goes against our our, own, our model minority myth. Yeah, our own model okay. that Canadians are the nice people of the world, right? I mean, it's funny, we talk about Jim Crow laws in the United States. We don't realize that there were several Canadian provinces uh, that actually made it illegal for Chinese business owners to hire white women yep. on the basis that you could be that uh, we didn't want our white women being close to these you know these 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 Asians who would you know sexually corrupt them right Wasn't uh, there, what, weren't there citizenship barriers too for Chinese okay. workers yeah both countries had citizenship barriers yeah. uh, there were the exclusion acts in both countries uh, Canada had the head tax um, Let's see. And uh, Chinese Canadians, even if they were born in Canada, could not vote until 1947. That's right. That's what I was thinking of. There was a particularly nasty one. Yeah. 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 And uh, in um, some provinces, they were specifically barred out of uh, certain professions like law or medicine. That's right. Which sounds bizarre now, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, but uh, we talk a lot about Jim Crow laws, uh, at least my generation of history teachers talked a lot about Jim Crow laws and then, and then we just sort of say, but in Canada, things were okay, which is not true. Now, get, getting back to Fu Manchu, mm -hmm. uh, Fu Manchu is a character created by the uh, British author, Sax Romer, and Fu Manchu was the super villain in these novels that Sax Romer wrote. Uh, he, 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 let this massive criminal, Asian criminal organization whose only purpose was to take over the world. Right? Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's the origin of the 10 rings in Shang-Chi. It's straight yeah. up that. Straight up that, yeah. But, but and Fu Manchu was of course a racial stereotype. He was a foreigner, he was evil, he was devious. He, he, he had the long fingernails, you know, he wore the-, the Stringy the, facial hair. Yeah, uh, weird beard that that was stereotypical of of of, uh, of of Chinese nobility at the time. Yeah, and it's amazingly popular in the pulp novels. He spawned a lot of imitation characters as well, right? Like Ming the Merciless in the in Flash Gordon, right? And I always keep on people saying, "Well, Flash Gordon's that character is not racist. He's from the planet Mongo." And I thought, "Well, yeah, but." Yeah, I mean, what's interesting is the Doctor Strange character actually borrows on that somehow because a, a, a bit because magicians made themselves look more Asian, what they said, Oriental at the time to seem foreign and mysterious. And it's interesting that as long as the character is played by Benedict Cumberbatch, they keep that stuff. But when it comes to actual Asian characters, Marvel falls all over itself it, it fell all over itself for years trying to figure out how to fail with you know an iron man 3 the mandarin being played by ben kingsley whose background is south asian not east asian there's yeah. nothing mandarin about him oh, oh, oh he comes off as english a lot well he, he, yeah. he is partly english too right he's not yeah. just south asian he's also partly english right yeah and and and, and it's, it's interesting because you always hear comic book nerds Etc. cetera, uh, geeks, always arguing about loyalty to the source material, you know, it's got to be loyal to the source material, which is a joke, because if you look at the source material, the source material is never loyal to the source material either, right? I, I, I think, you know, Superman's origin was rewritten at least three times in the 1940s alone. Yeah, right? yeah, it evolved, yeah. Yeah, Johnny Byrne has another version of it in the 1980s, and each of the movies has a slightly different version of Superman's origin. So, uh, so Marvel is obviously trying to, uh, in the comic books from the 70s, Shang-Chi is the son of Fu Manchu, mm -hmm. right? And, and 
And it, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, the most popular of the Marvel comic books. The character, all the Shang Chi was a minor character, but now he's in a movie. Right? He he was very influential, but not popular. It was it was one of those characters that a lot of the stuff they did with Shang Chi got spread into other characters like Iron Fist and and things like that. But yeah, he himself kind of fell into obscurity, and there's a lot of theories as to why, but. Part of it, unfortunately, was racist comic book censorship laws in in the 50s with that more with that moral panic involving everything in comics, but crime and, you know, depiction of minorities and comics became very, very sanitized for well, the, she, she white was, audiences. Yeah, she actually was in the comic books in the 70s, I remember, yeah. but it wasn't it wasn't one of Marvel's big bestsellers. Right. I, he, yeah. he was in the original the character originally was the son of Fu Manchu, I guess the son who defected to the good side. And right? then he became the son of the Mandarin, which is essentially Fu Manchu by another name. So, so now Marvel in the Marvel Comics Universe movies is, has jettisoned uh, Fu Manchu as a character and has rewritten the Mandarin into uh, not really the Mandarin, but just a dupe, <laughs> just a, 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 a uh, naive actor who gets duped into pretending to be a character. Right. right? And you know what, I, I, to those people who say, uh, you know, this isn't loyal to the source material, you know, deal with it. Uh, Superman isn't, the Superman legend has always been diverging away from the source material. The Wonder Woman movies, are that accurate to the source material. Uh, movies I, and pop culture change with the time. I've been mentioning this to a few people now that people weren't all up in arms that they changed the Asgardians, Thor and Loki and company into aliens instead of Norse gods and then sort of changed them back. They're very loosey-goosey about whether they are in fact gods or not. But they are essentially aliens. Um, okay, they're loosey-goosey with their ages. Um, and then they sort of have trouble figuring out whether Loki is a god of mischief or a god of chaos or just straight up Norse Hitler, fascist, full on authoritarian. People don't freak out about changes to source material with that, though they clearly are. I mean, in the comics, Dr. Doom was the one that wanted to take over everything all the time. Loki was more, oh, we're going to kidnap Jane Foster again and be something of a bastard. But the, the, the scope of the peril, again, because of the Comics Code Authority, was much more minor than they do right now. I mean, they, they didn't ever have um, a villain marching into the UN with an army and just sort of taking it over the way they do in like Marvel's What If. So there definitely seems to be a, a different treatment when a non-white culture goes, no, we're going to take another crack at this. We're going to strip it down to its core components, figure out what we want to keep, figure out what they don't, what we don't want to keep. Because I mean, some of the stuff that they did in Shang-Chi was kind of controversial. We'll get into how the Chinese government reacted in a second, but this is where people start getting really uncomfortable. We see the double standard. We see how two things are handled predominantly differently. I mean, they even have to change things like the Captain America storylines just because of the, the sheer time that's passed since World War II, right? why do people seem more okay with changing the entire what the Asgardians are, but they make Taskmaster a woman or they take out the yellow pair in Shang-Chi and there's all this ink spilled? I think uh, it, 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 it's, it's hard to say, but I think in a lot of cases, and I know one notable Canadian science fiction writer whose name I won't mention uh, right now, who seems to love a lot of old racist cult novels, especially the Sax Rumor Fu Manchu ones, right? And I think in cases for people of that age, he's in his 60s or 70s or something like that. Um, I think in those cases, there's such a nostalgia for the books 
and comic books they enjoyed as a child, that if you change the, uh, the storyline or change the characters, they see that as being uh, an attack upon what they enjoyed as okay. a child. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. And you see this a lot um, on social media. You know, he says, what, you know, this character is, is considered racist. Well, I enjoyed that comic book when I was a kid. Am I a racist, right? And, and of course, you know, by, they always interpret um, criticizing an, an, an old movie as a criticism of them. So, you know, you criticize something like Song of the South, that old Disney movie. <laughs> okay. And suddenly people say, I saw that movie when I was a kid. Does that mean I'm a racist? No, it doesn't mean you're a racist, but people it always- could, to that. It could just mean you're a furry. Right, I mean that—that's the thing. I th I enjoyed Song of the South when I was a kid. I recognize it's extremely racist, right? And this is an example of a movie that was not trying to be racist. It was progressive for its time. This is the problem with progressive politics: is the stuff we think is super woke today will probably seem extremely racist in thirty years, right? Things like the term Latinx is only used by three percent of people from either either Chicano or, or various Latin American heritage. Um, but this term is being forced on them by the media, even though they don't use it. And, you know, I always liked the, the mystics, the sorcerers, when I was a kid. I didn't know the Yellow Peril background. I just thought they were cool, like Skeletor from He-Man. And so I actually liked those characters. I saw them as powerful. I saw them as um mysterious that doesn't mean it didn't have a racist root and i don't have a problem saying i liked it i didn't know now that i do know i'm fine with giving it up you know i think what they did with tony lung as uh wenwei ji wenwei um i thought it was kind of clever they almost pulled in uh a combination of the Han unification of China and Genghis Khan for that character, which I was like, ha, huh, they're not shying away from some kind of Orientalist tropes with the Mongol hordes, right? Like the invaders, but they've, they've mixed it enough with the Han unification of China thing that People seem to be okay with it. Is, is this more an art than a science that if something seems authentic, if something seems to be done with love, you don't have to totally sanitize things because, you know, you said that the crime boss, the Asian crime boss is a yellow peril trope, but that, I mean, they still use that. The Tang Rings is still there. Shang-Chi's sister, you know, is involved in it. How, how do you, how do you approach as a creator yourself and as an editor, making a story exciting and allowing there to be heroes and villains represented and still not stepping on those stereotypes in a way that's offensive. Well, I, I think it depends on both intent and uh, nuance. And I'll explain what I mean. Um, you, you mentioned that there are some older movies or, or pop, popular culture products mm -hmm. that you know, may have been intended to be progressive yep. uh, at their time, but now seem dated. Uh, one must also look at the uh, intent. Um, uh, you can watch, for example, D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation. I mean, it's <laughs> a cinematic style point of view. It's a masterpiece. But let's be honest, there was no way Griffith's uh, depiction of Black people in that movie was ever intended to be progressive. Right, right. Unlike Jack, unlike, unlike the X-Men, that you know, St Stanley and various artists created that was intended to be evocative of the civil rights struggle. Yeah. Um, but then you know, then you get Jack Kirby creating Black Panther, having no idea there was a <laughs> militant civil rights group called the Black. P he had no idea. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure how Kirby and Stanley missed that, but they did. So first you have to look at intent, right? So, um, so and, and you look through the, the history of the way um, minorities have been depicted in movies, comic books, and pop culture. And a lot of times, it, it's funny. Um, I, I was watching uh, 
a movie once and, and there's a minstrel show character which where the characters make a lot of racist jokes about, oh, I'm gonna visit, I'm gonna invite my grandmother to this party. Uh, they'll let her out of the zoo sometime, you know, horribly racist jokes, yeah. right? And yet when we go to social media, there's always gonna be those people who say, oh, this was representation, a black actor, of black people, blah, 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 you know, why complain? You know, and you're thinking, no, the intent of that scene was not progressive. It right. was certainly as an insult. So you have to look at intent. Now, about going to how do you make uh, characters from different ethnic groups who are who can be heroes or villains and 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 avoid the stereotyping? I think what you need to do is look at make the character some nuance, right? Um, one of the problems with stereotypes, you know, the problem with stereotypes is not necessarily that they're untru untrue. It could be true. The problem with stereotypes is that they're, they're incomplete. That's interesting. Right, stereotypes aren't necessarily false. What stereotypes do, they take one aspect and usually just one aspect of uh, an ethnic group or a religious group or a culture and make that the only aspect attributable. Right that right right and that's that's where the harm of stereotypes is that I, that's a really interesting nuance there now you say intent matters intent matters other matters. other academics say intent doesn't matter it's only how it's received by people who are upset right and now this is, where things, this is where things get complicated yeah okay because because there's, there's an old saying that uh, if you uh, if you don't word something correctly and you fail to communicate what you meant in the memo, uh, it isn't it isn't your it isn't the uh, receiver's fault for not figuring what the memo meant. It was uh, your fault for 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 writing a memo that other people couldn't understand. Uh huh. Right. And um, th this is interesting because a skilled artist would use enough nuance to get the intent across. And what I keep on telling people is do your research, um, you know, get beta readers uh, to, to read your, your stories, you know, uh, uh, be sensitive to what other people are thinking, okay, and feeling, right? Uh, if you're writing about characters from outside your own uh, ethnicity or from your own political group or, from, or, or who just are not you, right? Right. Where, where, I, where I find that uh, some people flop is that uh, they, they don't do, even if they have good intentions, they don't do enough of that groundwork before they write their product, right? So, so uh, intent does matter, but, uh, but intent isn't the only issue at stake. Nuance okay. matters too. Okay, so, right? and and I ask you this because some people are trying to cancel the star of Shang-Chi, Simulu, for comments he made about Nicki Minaj and Ariana Grande and Big Sean claiming he's racist against Black people. Um, to me, this feels like a bit of trying to, you know, cut down the tall poppy a bit. Um, but, you know, he, they, they cite a, a bad Twitter joke he um, made then deleted um, about, <laughs> he said, it was in 2012, so nine years ago, I thought I was at a Nicki Minaj concert for 20 minutes before I realized it was a homeless man yelling at a pigeon. This pissed off Nicki Minaj fans. People here know I'm a Nicki Minaj fan, though some of her behavior has been problematic late, but this is this is an example of a criticism or more sort of a joke of her video production techniques at the time she had this tendency to put the camera super low and like scream into the camera like this i got what he was going for as a fan of hers but they're trying to paint him as having a problem with black people and or black women because he made a joke about an individual Mm -hmm. And how, with, with your, with your theories of intent, how do you sort of contextualize that? I'd say a scandal, but it was reported by Vice. So full disclosure, Vice is clickbaity. 
he was, he was this, you know, his name drives search engine optimization. Some of this stuff happens, but fair criticism or, or low blow here. Uh, I, I think low blow. And let's look at the other factor I mentioned, nuance. Mm -hmm. Okay, nuance. So I remember years ago at Toronto International Film Festival, there was a movie out about uh, a bunch of liberals. And they get this weird idea that to invite conservatives and other people they don't like to dinner and poison them. Yes, there's the, no nuance there. <laughs> I forget the name of the movie. Yeah. And, 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 and but, uh, you know, and, and, and it, it, it starts out as an accidental poisoning or an accidental murder. And then they realize, hey, you know, if we, if we did this correctly, we could sort of make it look like an accident, right? And it, when, it's one of those movies where one bad idea snowballs into a worse idea, snowballs into a worse idea. Uh, now, uh, the, the person who's the ringleader of this group is, you know, African American or Black American. And some of the audience stood up and said, you're a racist because you made the villain as a Black person. And the director said, if you see that character as only being a Black person, that's right. Examine your own attitudes about race. Right. And, and that's, that's my concern is that you think about how many Shakespearean British actors get a chance to play really great movie villains, right? And yeah. if we make anybody embodying any bad guy whatsoever as racist, that denies parts to care to actors of color yeah and and, and, and what but and then you have to go see how is that character of color portrayed in the movie is he a stereotype is he just one dimensional and only reflects all the old tropes and stereotypes of the ethnic group or is he a more fleshed out character now let, let's take this back to Nicki Minaj and whether Mick, Nicki Minaj sounds like a homeless person <laughs> singing, a cat singing to a pigeon <laughs> okay all right, so uh, Simu Liu obviously thought Nicki Minaj's music wasn't that great, but uh, was it because she's black? Right. Or, and these people who are defending Nicki Minaj, uh, are they seeing her only as a black person? In which case they should be examining their own uh, uh, attitudes about race, right? <laughs> or are they seeing her as being a uh, person who has a music which may appeal to some people and other people, right? And all artists are like that. All your art doesn't, won't appeal to everybody out there in the audience, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is where things get interesting because if you think that uh, someone is criticizing an artist and that person is automatically racist because that artist comes from, you know, is black or Asian or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, are you criticizing that person because, uh, you, you, you're seeing that artist as just being the black artist. There right? is sort of a um, reduction of the artist when you when you reduce them to a class like that, isn't yeah. there? Yeah, yeah, and and you know what? It, 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 I'm pretty sure there are some fans of some artists who do reduce their 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 favorite uh, actors or singers or whatever uh, to basically being a a um, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? A totem? Uh, 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 yeah, an avatar of something. Avatar, yeah, yeah. 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 So it, it's funny. I mean, if you don't like one of my stories, are you suddenly uh, racist against Asians? Well, I, I think it depends on why they don't like the story. Well, yeah, it depends on why they don't like the story, right? But, right. Um, right? I mean, there's going to be some people who don't like my story because, uh, you know, they don't like Asian. Canadian writers, right? But there's going to be other people say, you know, the characterization was thin, the plot led nowhere, whatever, right? It depends, right? This yeah. is where the nuance is important. Now, speaking of nuance, Asian, uh, Asian diaspora creators have, you guys are wedged in between two problems here, right? Because you've got the exoticized minority and all the dismissals and all that stuff in the West, but then you've got the pressures from the Chinese Communist Party as well, and you know you've you've obviously brushed up against this editing, um, you know um, 
you know, international Chinese artists, but you've also contacted some, some um, uh, Chinese uh, writers in, in China, at least Hong Kong, right? Through, through your various travels and stuff like that. So t- talk about, because Shang-Chi deals with this being trapped between two worlds and really completely belonging to none theme. And talk about that, because I think that's a very real ground truth that is somewhat unique to uh, people of Asian backgrounds just because they don't have that, well, it was forced migration due to slavery, therefore they are indigenous peoples. It's that perpetual foreigner thing you were talking about, right? Yeah, so yeah. as my phone rings rudely, um, can you can you break that down a bit? What where the tension is there, where the nuance is? All right. Now, uh, you, you brought in a lot of things here. You also yeah. brought in you know, the censorship in uh, mainland China from the Chinese Communist Party, yeah. which actually doesn't have a lot to do with what uh, Asian uh, Amer- Canadian and Asian American writers have to deal with. Right. Unless we somehow have to get our words translated over there. then we get into a diff- whole set of different problems well like um, I, I say that because in the film industry the chinese box office is desirable so there's all this concern that more and more companies like disney are kind of bending the knee to china to get that you know five billion dollar box office oh right yeah yeah well uh, well first uh, a lot of the a lot of asian canadian and asian american writers don't wind up writing scripts for big budget movies anyway, right? Fair. None of us wrote for Marvel comics or for, for any of the MCU movies, right? Uh, so uh, we're, we're, that's not really where our issues with, uh, with uh, foreign censorship come in, right? Uh, close at home here in the United States and Canada, where we often run into issues is that uh, Editors like to have stereotypical stories from us. It, it's interesting. I, a couple of years ago, I, I saw some uh, the note written by uh, an agent, or was it an editor from a publishing house to uh, an author, a Korean American author, saying, uh, "Your story isn't really very good because your characters, they're Korean Americans, but you don't see them eating kimchi. Uh, they eat." like uh, hot dogs and spaghetti, like other Americans. And, you know, they don't do these rituals at home and so on. Um, This isn't the type of story we're looking for. So there's a lot of, uh, which is interesting because again, it goes back to the problem with stereotypes. Isn't that they're true? Is that they're, uh, they're, they're, they're- They're limiting. Yeah, they're incomplete. They're limiting, they're incomplete, right? Uh, so it's it's hard to get anything written or published uh, unless you conform to a bunch of stereotypes, right? And, and you see this in, in, in publishing. Uh, now, uh, about trying to get that, the movie, it's really just the movie industry that's trying yeah. to get that big, that big Chinese market. It's not really publishing. I mean, l- 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 let's face it, um, whoever Margaret Atwood's publisher is, isn't really desperately trying to push a Chinese translation of The Handmaid's Tale or any of right. right, 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 right. Uh, now, mind you, there, there is this whole um, other issue about trying to push Western or Canadian science fiction into China, but that's a whole other issue than the Marvel mm-hmm. Comics push to get the Chinese box office. Um, I thought, there was this Transformers movie. Was it the one with, with uh, Mark Wahlberg, mm-hmm. tra- where, where where Hong Kong gets hit mm-hmm. by by the enemy, and and there's a character that spends about you know several minutes of screen time blathering on about the central government will defend Hong Kong, but uh, which I had to laugh because it was ultimately not the central government that defends Hong Kong, right? And um, uh, th- there's this big push in China. You know, China's funny. It, it's it's, it's, it's become this very nationalistic state. I mean, it always was, right? But it's, uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party has evolved to be a, uh, a, uh, a, a one-party, non-democratic, uh, nationalist, very nationalistic party, mm-hmm. but at the same time, it's not really communist anymore. It's just communist in name yeah. now. 
right? Yeah. And uh, and and so uh, it it also it has a lot of control over you know culture, right? Uh, and it always wants the party to look good. Right. The in, face. In, the face thing. Yeah. Yeah. In in pop culture, and so that that influences what uh, foreign pop culture products can be imported. So I have a story about the dragon of the stars. So here's the dragon of the stars, right? So Aurora Award winner <laughs> in best related work. It's the first anthology of uh, science fiction and fantasy written by overseas Chinese. Mm -hmm. And uh, it actually created you know, some interest in the science fiction community in, uh, in China. By science fiction community, I mean the science fiction fans and science mm -hmm. fiction writers. And there, there was a science fiction writer who uh, said, well, he was willing to help me get a Chinese translation published in China, but he had two questions for me. One, do any of the stories portray the Chinese Communist Party in a negative or uncomplimentary mm -hmm. light? Mm -hmm. The second question was rather interesting. Uh, do any of these stories show overseas Chinese being oppressed and harassed by Western nations or Western people? And I uh -huh. thought, hmm, those are two interesting stories. Well, the reason for him asking the first question, do any of these stories show uh, uh, the party in a very uncomplimentary light or negative light? I could understand why he would ask that one, right? The second story was interesting because, uh, because you know, why would the party be interested in whether stories show Chinese people being harassed or victims of racism and so on? And another, and a Chinese American writer whose name I won't mention <laughs> mm -hmm. for obvious reasons, explained it to me this way. Well, that's because some people in mainland China might see such stories as being symbolic or being a metaphor for China being weak or harassed by other countries. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. interesting. Because with Shang-Chi, they planted, or, or or the argument is these stories were planted. They were they were Chinese Communist Party propaganda um, about the yellow peril connotations of Shang-Chi and it can't possibly be a good movie. And it's, you know, basically rotten to the core. They still haven't approved the film for screening in China, like mainland China, even though some Chinese directors have seen it in Hong Kong. Um, is there any real rhyme or reason to it? Or is it more one of these, like you said, it's an authoritarian nationalist party it kind of changes with the wind, whatever they think oh, is, yeah. is, is gonna maintain the, the narrative at any given time. Yeah, what, what's interesting about censorship in China is that what could be banned one week could be okay the next week and then yeah. banned against the third week, right? And that happens in China a bit. Like there, there, there was one famous sci Chinese science fiction short story, which was, um, which was not very complimentary about Japan. For right. obvious reasons, right? Uh, China suffered greatly under Japan during the Second World War. Sure. And then it was banned. And the reason why it was banned was because at that time, the, the People's Republic of China wanted to reestablish diplomatic relations with Japan. Okay. Right? So, and then, uh, and then at times when, uh, when, when, when relations with Japan aren't great, that story's uh, 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 not banned, just to show right. people how evil the Japanese are, right? So the censorship is really wonky over there. Also, censorship over there isn't like the old Soviet-inspired censorship of the of the old days. Um, you know, there's no. It, it's it's very localized by local uh, political uh, staff, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, there's so it's not necessarily. Although there still is centralized state oversight, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it could also be localized as well, right? Now, it doesn't, oh. doesn't, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Now let's bring this back to Shang-Chi, right? right. So, so right now, uh, the Chinese party, the Chinese Communist Party uh, doesn't really like Shang-Chi, the movie, but I think it, and it's yet another example of where it's not necessarily the artistic product of the movie or the book that uh, 
they find objectionable. It could be the artist that they find objectionable. Okay. The the lead in, in Simu Liu because he's been critical in the past? Yes, he has been. Um, yeah. Simu Liu has commented that uh, uh, his parents, I think it was his parents or people his parents knew, uh, went through periods when they didn't have enough food. In yeah. China. Yeah. And he, that, that was his experience. He spoke about that when he was on Kim's Convenience, that he called it a third world country. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the, the party is very uh, sensitive about things like that. Uh, for example, that was the reason why the party uh, censored those uh, time travel TV shows. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is one news story that all the North Americans and Westerners got wrong. Interesting, okay. Because uh, about eight years ago, nine years ago, China imposed a ban, uh, which wasn't really a complete ban, on uh, science fiction stories and TV shows about time travel, right? And in the Western press, you've got all these stories of, oh, Doctor Who must be banned, and Time Tunnel is banned, and, uh, and all these shows are banned. But interesting enough, while this ban was on, and I was in Beijing, I saw a movie poster for, uh, for that, was it Looper? That movie where Bruce okay. Willis goes back in time, right? And, and he's an assassin who goes back in time, right? It's Looper, right? Right? It was, I thought Looper had Hayden Christensen in it, but that might be Jumper. I'll take your word for it that it's Looper. It's Bruce Willis something, we get the gist. It was a Bruce Willis movie, right? And yeah. there he goes back in time, right? And uh, I said, well, wait a minute. I thought there was so, everyone outside China saying there's a ban on time travel movies, and yet here's a poster for right. this movie. But what it really was, was um, starting about 10 years ago, there was this big trend in the Chinese TV shows where the characters traveled back in time to say some previous dynasty, like the Ming dynasty or, or, or the Song dynasty. Right, and they find a lot of love and romance back okay. in that historic period, right? And you know who can blame them? The, the costumes are gorgeous, etc. Right? It's it's like Chinese Outlander. Right. <laughs> they go back and meet these highly highly attractive romanticized versions of right. spots where he kills. Right. But here here they go back to the Ming Dynasty or or the Song Dynasty or whatever. Right. And um, there was uh, the, the Chinese party, the, the Communist Party thought there were too many of these shows because they thought that these shows implied that people aren't happy with present day hmm. through China. They're have, finding love and happiness uh, in our previous dynastic past. Hmm. That, that's a very fragile ego on a government. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, one Chinese science fiction writer explained it to me this way, the majority of Chinese science fiction stories that involve time travel have time travel to the past. Mm -hmm. There aren't many stories that show time travel to the future because time travel to the future requires imagining political and social structures of the future. And this is problematic in China. Okay. Okay, right. right. So, what was the time travel ban on TV shows really? First, it wasn't a total ban. Uh, what happened was they, uh, they, they limited the number of series that could be produced, but um, they were still being made and they had to be shown at nine o'clock after prime time. Okay. Right, so it wasn't a total ban and no Doctor Who was not banned, Looper wasn't banned. That's interesting, but there's there it much much like between the Soviets and the Americans during the Cold War, there's misunderstanding and misinformation going both ways. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what's what's going on with Shang Chi is uh, Simu Liu, uh, you know, has has made a few comments that aren't complimentary to uh, that the, the the Chinese Communist Party considers not complimentary to the party or the country. That is people had trouble finding food in the past. Right. Right. And there's always been this issue in China, you know, China about food scarcity. Right. Because it's, it's an issue. It's an issue. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, it was a, it, you know, traditionally China and a lot of other Asian countries have always had issues with food scarcity. 
And it wasn't until the, 19, the late 1980s that the truth came out about the Great Leap Forward that it actually caused a massive famine in China in the 1950s. The Communist Party kept that secret from the West for a good uh, three and a half decades. I'm not sure how they did it for three mm -hmm. and a half decades because it would have leaked out in any other country, but they kept it secret uh, for three and a half decades. Now, do you think, I mean, to me, that makes what Simu Liu is doing around this movie so much more important, right? The fact that he made that comment, got hired anyway, is beloved except by, you know, Nicki Minaj fans. Um, do, do you, how much do we want to read into his sort of light level activism as a personality, not just his performance in the film? Do you think it's possible for him to overdo it? Do you support him using that platform to sort of promote the Asian American experience or in his case, in your case, Asian Canadian? Where again, because you're talking about intent and nuance, where do you think the lines should be here? Well, we're talking about several different issues here at yeah. the same time, right? Well, first, vis-a-vis -vis the political commentary, uh, you know, there's lots of actors out there, not just Simu Liu, who make political commentaries. That's true. Right? That, that's true. So uh, why should, you know, and he's living in Canada and he works in the United States. Why should, what do, what, what right do any of us have to restrict him while we let say, uh, um, George you know, Clooney wear a shirt that compares MAGA types to the Confederacy and Nazis. Yeah. 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 And, and we, we, we've long had people like uh, actors like Richard Gere, for example, comment about Tibet. Uh, That's right. Various actors comment about either uh, Donald Trump or Joe Biden. Uh, we, we've had actors comment on uh, Israel and Palestine. We've had actors comment about all sorts of political issues. We have actors commenting about Texas's new abortion law. That's true. Uh, why should uh, we uh, think Simu Liu should be in any way uh, less quiet than these other actors because he's uh, uh, Chinese Canadian? Right? Because Well, he's got this massive franchise on his back, right? Marvel actors tend to go very quiet about yeah. things. Yeah, and, and th that leads to another issue, right? Um, er all these actors, they have to deal with uh, studio bosses yep. sooner or later, right? And then it becomes an issue of, uh, of, you know, do you keep quiet because your studio boss wants you or do you, right. do you take the risk and express your own opinion mm -hmm. on some issue where the studio boss might think it threatens the market? And that gets into a whole other issue of, of, uh, of your relationship with your, with, your, uh, with your employers and who you who are your employers, right? right? So there's no right or wrong answer to that. Uh, in some cases, uh, your, your, your movie studio might, you know, want to take that risk. In some cases, they might not do, want to. Uh, it, it's, it's, very, it, it's a very complicated issue. And it, it ultimately boils down to the actor's own relationship with the mm -hmm. studio bosses, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned another issue about, you know, Simu Liu, you know, um, talk about representation of Asians, right? And, and uh, I, what's that TV show that they show on CTV? It's sort of like the Canadian counterpart of The View. Uh, uh, oh, uh, The Social? The Social, The okay. Social. Okay, so The Social, you know, the, all the hosts of The Social are women. Yeah. Right? And I, 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 I had to, you know, I was reasonably, uh, 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 in, I reasonably enjoyed that one episode where, uh, he shows up and they talk about all these photographs of him without his shirt on. The stock photos yeah, from yeah. before he was famous, yeah. yeah. And, and, and Simi Liu's got a point, is that traditionally uh, Asians and Asian Americans and Asian Canadians in pop culture have been portrayed only according to certain stereotypes. There are always that annoying tenant in the, uh, that, that Jack, is it Jack Nicholson portrays in The Breakfast at Tiffany's. Okay. Right. You, yeah. you know the character I'm talking about. Yeah, it's it's a it's a cameo character. It's sort of a walk on. They open the door, yell loud funny words. Yeah. He's got the buck teeth and the yeah. glasses. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. He's just annoying, right? Yeah. And then 
and also that other nerdy, annoying character who no one will date in the uh, 16 candles. Yeah, well, that's a that's a pan Asian thing. I mean, that's traced through with Raj on Big Bang Theory. Yeah, yeah. And we're always being portrayed this way, right? And mm-hmm. it, it's, it's interesting. I remember um, at the uh, at the Canadian uh, academic conference on science fiction and fantasy several years ago, uh, some there was one actually interesting. A, a white woman, PhD student, gave a paper on how certain minorities are always played according to type in science fiction, and she was talking to me afterwards, and she said. Did you notice when it came time to make one of the traditional Star Trek characters gay? Ooh, the yeah. Asian character? I think that I think there were a bit of blinders because it was George Takei, but even he had an issue with that. So the character's written a straight, let the character be straight. And right. And she said, what they and she, we talked and we noticed how all the liberal progressives are saying, this is great, this is wonderful. And that people who objected to this, including George Takei, um, we're, uh, we're, 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 we're somehow criticized as being, you know, a, a trans, a, a gay phobic, right? Or, or anti gay. Homophobic, yeah. Jeez, yeah. Right? But she brought up an interesting point, which I saw and George Takei saw too, although no one's willing to admit that George Takei saw this too, is that once again, when they had to, t- to make a character who's not going to get a girl in a heterosexual relationship. Right. It was the Asian character, right? Right. Uh, the guy who directed that particular Star Trek movie, it was that actor who played Scotty and he, he's in that zombie movie. What's his yeah, name? Yeah, Simon Pegg. Yeah, he, she said, if Simon Trick had, Pegg had truly wanted to be brave about turning a, a traditional character into a gay character, he would have chosen Scotty. Sure. And he would have had to play the gay character. Yeah, I mean, it is, I, I think... So, this is where we get into the thing about art and things being in the realm of art and someone being an artist and then there being politics and the difference between a theme and preaching. Yeah. So right. let, let's bring this back to Simu Lu without a right. shirt on. Okay. This, this, this is, this is. Please go back to Simu Lu without <laughs> a shirt on. <laughs> this is where the intersectionality shows up. Right. So in Star Trek, even when the Asian character is supposed to be a positive character hey you know gay people are, are are decent human kind caring adventurous people too right yeah in that case as this phd student and i and george takei noticed it's still fed into a stereotype that the asian male is not threatening and will not get the girl because he won't get the girl right, right. now we're simu lu is is is, is really um uh, you know, making a big, uh, big advance for Asian representation mm-hmm. and probably annoying people who hold on to old stereotypes is he's showing that uh, the Asian male uh, isn't, can possibly be sexually appealing to women. Right. Yeah. I mean, that goes all the way back to Kim's convenience where he was sort of the dumb, cute one that was in sort of the will they or won't they sitcom relationship. I thought that was a real busting of stereotypes at, yeah, at yeah. the time. Yeah. Stereotypes. You, you notice that in pop culture, even if the Asian character is not the villain, um, he's going to be safe for the white males there because he's never going to encroach upon the white males getting the hot white girl or the hot Asian girl. You spend any time in any club in Toronto, you recognize that's not true. You know, it, it, at least not here. Um, is that, is that again, that model minority thing, because it was developed in contrast to the black civil rights movement, it just became this opposing stereotype. No, I, I think it was because a lot of pop culture is controlled by white males. Okay. Right. So they and- just want everything kept to themselves. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, you look at a lot of movies, right? And look at movies, comic books, TV shows. Uh, who's always the character who gets to, you know, have sex with whatever girl he wants? It's always the white guy. Even in Star Trek, Captain Kirk bedded yeah. practically every girl in the galaxy. Right? Yeah. Sulu didn't, right? I, I, I always found that so performative, right? This performative virility, because you can't assume a man's virile unless he's shoving it in your, in your face all the time, right? But, 
you know, and, and that, that, that's what, you know, that's what middle-aged white male studio executives like. It. Okay, that, that is true. That's why there's always boobs in their first episode of an HBO show. It, right. It's true. That microcosm, they demand it. Yeah, and, and that's why Raj in Big Bang Theory is so socially stunted when it comes to girls. I mean, all the characters were originally socially stunted, right? But generals in Big Bang Theory, after about season three, all these girlfriends started to show up, except Raj never I, got them. That really bothered me. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that was deliberate. That was deliberate because the Asian character is not socially threatening to uh, the white males in, in the show. Uh, Simu Liu is trying to break down that barrier. And the kudos to him for breaking it up. Now, I, I know a guy who's a customer at Hooters who uh, was sort of annoyed by that because, you know, he's, he's the white guy who's always chasing after the Asian girls. He, he can't, he, he, he never wants to be in the section served by the white girl, right? Oh and, boy. And he, yeah, he's, uh, he, you know, he, he's the type of guy who probably isn't going to like Shang-Chi and the Legend of Ten Rings. Now, how would, because you don't want that stereotype of, like, I like him and Katie as friends. That is a nice change as well, right? The love story in the movie is between the parents. But you can't have him be this sexless, dateless, you know, inert character that way, because that is also a stereotype. So are they going to have to hook him up with somebody else in the MCU? Well, we we don't know what they got in store with the MCU, right? Right. Now the Athena character, I wish I could remember the names of the characters. As, uh, Katie. Katie, yeah. right? She seems pretty close to them and they, they do go through the, um, the big warp portal thing yeah. together. So it could develop that way or it could, it could just, that could be a red herring and they just give us another twist. And yeah, See, I, I want to see her and Wong get together or something like that. Like, yeah, I want her to meet somebody but not her high school friend. Right. Well, we'll, we'll see what the writers come up with. Yeah, like I, I'd like to see them getting some others. Uh, there's, there's um, you know, there's a lot. There's some of those sidekick characters as well. There's Jimmy Woo from. It's amazing how many of these Asian sidekick characters there are in Marvel that they're bringing to the forefront right now. Those are just the men I could think of because they've moved everybody else up a rung, right? They moved up Winter Soldier. They've moved up. Uh, Falcon they haven't moved up the because Jimmy Woo was originally from Ant-Man I believe Wong's from Doctor Strange I mean they're they're trying to make Wong is a very problematic character because he's a servant in the comics it's yeah. not great um well it's hard to speculate what Marvel will write in its movies in the future I mean who who thought that you know Black Widow would get killed off oops I gave away a spoiler well that movie's several years old already yeah that movie that movie's old I mean that that was a bunch of people I think Marvel was trying to renegotiate a bunch of contracts and overdid the murder of heroes on that one because they brought a bunch back, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, Simu Liu, he, he's, he's definitely in his roles in uh, Kim's Convenience. I know there's some controversy after Kim's Convenience got canceled and some you know, news of the making of the show began to get out. But, you know, he, he was definitely not like Raj and Big Bang Theory. He's no. That, like that character in 16 Canos, he definitely wasn't Fu Manchu. It was a, it was a very different type of character. And I'm pleased that uh, he's getting to play that type of character. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's nice that the character is written. It's, it's nice that, I mean, it's nice that it originated in Canada. I don't think that's an accident. I think maybe people had to see that character on Kim's convenience before they could imagine how it would work. No. Oh, can I tell you a story about, uh, about, um, Remember back in the 1990s, there was a Made in Canada sequel to the David Carradine Kung Fu. I guess there was. Who the Legend Continues, yep. right? Which, which was, which was, you know, so hilariously awful in how it sort of tried to use Chinese and Buddhist culture and so on. And, and yep. a friend of mine um, <laughs> was, was president of the Chris Potter fan club. You know, the Chris Potter, right? Yeah. Right? And um, and we went to visit the set. Well, she needed a ride, so I drove her to visit the set. And you know, you remember Chris Potter played the uh, the, 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 the the son of the um, Kane character. Right, Walker. right, yes, yeah. He's somehow he's still alive, right? And um, and and I had noticed something for that TV show was that either for a TV show that's supposed to be about 
a guy who came from China. There weren't a lot of Chinese actors in the show. Yes, right? very, very few. Very few, right? And, uh, and I asked, hey, do you think I could get a role as an extra here? Or why aren't there any Chinese actors? And she said something very specific. She said, you could get a role here as an extra as long as you play one of the villains. Ouch. Yeah, yeah. They were only using Chinese actors to play the villains in Kung Fu, The Legend Continues. And if you watch that show, I'm not sure if anyone's still showing it anymore. It's, it's like 25 years old by now. Uh, it's um, uh, most of the Chinese actors were usually used as villains. They were usually right. sent out to kill somebody. Uh, or the inept, incompetent prince who's, yes. who, who's laying claim to the throne of Imperial China. Yeah. And that yeah. character was a complete loser, right? He was nerdy, he was useless, etc. Again, another stereotype, right? Or uh, you were that, um, that, that, that girl who worked at the back of the restaurant. Right. One scene. Or, right? or some vaguely sex worker like massage parlor employee. Yeah, 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 those are the only roles Asians got in Kung Fu Legend continues. So I thought, shit, you know, I, I don't want to, uh, uh, you know, go to that set and get paid minimum wage to play the, the villain in the background. Yeah, it, that, that really sticks a pin in how quickly things have changed because that was only, that was less than 30 years ago. Uh, yeah, well, are they changing that quickly though? All, all we have is Kim's Convenience. and Well, there's Fresh Off the Boat in the yeah, US. Right, yeah. Um, they, I mean, they are, people forget the days where they made one of the Warriors three and Thor an Asian guy. And everybody was like, what's going on here? Everybody was kind of polite about it, but we're like, what happened here? Yeah. Um, they've, they've found increasingly better ways to include, um, Asian American characters, um, uh, in the Marvel cinematic universe. It, I, I do agree with you. I think it probably took too much, but at least it's happening, right? It's happening, yeah. At least it's happening. Hopefully it will, it will continue. I mean, we had uh, a chance she come out. There's that new Kung Fu series. I don't know if it's been renewed for a second season. Um, Crazy Rich Asians. Yeah, that was the yeah. movie. That came Parasite out. did incredibly well. Yeah. Now this is all before COVID hit, right? So right, of course. Because, because the, uh, because with COVID, as, 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 as you know, it, it became a racial issue as well. Right? Yes, yes. And I, surprisingly little of that with the Shang-Chi premiere, which is nice. Yeah, surprisingly little uh, social media. Well, I didn't really monitor social media at the time because I was busy writing my own story. To get right. Published, right, right. But, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it, 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 there was a period and probably still going people were, you know, blaming Chinese people of whatever origin, you know, even people born here. Uh, I got blamed for spreading COVID, right? By, by, yeah, that was ugly. By the spouse of a friend of mine, right? Who, uh, who uh, he actually said to me, well, uh, you, he didn't really blame me. He said, you're one of the different ones. He said, I don't blame you personally, but your race has got to take the, the blame for this. Right? Okay, what do you, to close, what do you do when someone says something like that? Like that's, Horrific. Yeah, you know what? It's it's hard to figure out what to do. I unfriend. Well, he unfriended me first, right? Before I could unfriend him, right? He unfriended me on Facebook, so that solved the. Uh, the do you Facebook. think he knew what he said? I think he knew what he said. Okay. Okay. I, I, I've met him before in the, oh, at that uh, at, at at a dinner at the RCMI. Yeah. You know which dinner? Yeah, right? I, I know. I know which one. Do, do you think he knew it was wrong? I don't think he knew it was wrong, uh, considering he also thinks Obama was born in Kenya. Oh, Lord. Okay. So, yeah. He was the Nazi postmaster general of Bohemia and Moravia. Yeah. It, th those sorts of things, I think people are still in kind of, people don't know what to do when that happens, when things are so egregious. People don't know how to handle it. They don't, they don't want to get angry, like, I've witnessed certain things that you've been through and I don't want to get angry on your behalf. I don't want to speak for you because if you just want to let it go, that's your choice, right? But I admit there have been a lot of situations I have not known what to do. And it's tough, right? Because you don't want to- Because it depends on the situ where, where you are at 
right the situation where you don't want to make a big scene at the uh at the uh, lieutenant governor's reception for example or you don't you don't want to be speaking for somebody either right yeah. you know sometimes it depends right i, I mean uh, uh sometimes you should be speaking on behalf of other people right i mean let's look at history not all the freedom riders are black some of them were white some of them were jewish some of them were yeah. christian right um uh, right. they right sometimes you you should be speaking on behalf of people but the um the where you draw the line is uh, is um, you should be speaking on behalf of people and not letting them speak on behalf on their own behalf at the same time did that make sense yes when they start talking shut up yeah yeah right right i don't think this uh, spokes of a friend of mine uh, i don't think he actually thought what he was saying was wrong he says it wasn't racist because i called him on it says that's racist no it's not racist it's the truth. That, so. See, that's one of those things where people have a very visceral reaction to being called racist. Oh, yeah, yeah. But so, like I was talking before when people pointed out the Fu Manchu stuff that I thought was cool as a kid was like super racist. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it is. You know, OK, I didn't create that. I didn't say it. But, you know, I, I don't I don't think anybody's immune to this. And how do you think we get past this gut reaction of being called, not being called a racist, because I don't think you should summarize an entire person's character. It's that nuanced thing again by one statement. But when someone points out to you that something you did was racist, how do you get past that gut instinct to get defensive? Well, it's interesting. If you truly are a racist, you won't get past that gut instinct. No, of course not. Right. 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 Um, the, 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 Someone who is more, uh, I, I should say, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, someone who's more, uh, more, who's who's more into thinking and stuff, right. would just step back and think, oh, you know what? Maybe that wasn't the right thing to say, or maybe that wasn't the good thing to do. You right. know what? I won't do it again, or I've learned better. So just just doing better next time is all kind of anybody can really do. You know, it, it, not only is it all anyone can any do, it's also what people would like you to do. Okay, yeah. Instead of the big, the big genuflecting, I'm terrible, I need to work on myself. That's all kind of performative, isn't it? Well, if you really do end up working on yourself, then it's not performative. Okay, okay. So it's back to intense again. Yeah, back to intense. Yeah. Now, now, mind you, the people who say, I intend to work myself, I was guilty, I was bad, blah, blah, blah. Most of those people who say that, um, they, they probably, that's probably, they probably do mean that, right? right. Because if they didn't mean that, they would be saying that. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, they're kind of bound to it when they say that in public. Well, uh, are they, it depends whether they're saying in public or not, right? I mean, yeah. some, Apologies are, are, are meaningless. Like I'm talking right. about the the two recent NDP candidates that were caught making anti-Semitic tweets. And they're like, I have more to learn. And I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> you know what? There again, it depends on the situation. I mean, yeah. if, it's, if it's in private and someone says, oh, I, I, I did wrong. I realized that was not you right. know, a good viewpoint. Blah, blah, blah. I'll do better next time. I've got a lot to learn. If that's in private, it's probably genuine. Yes, agree. Yeah. And I was talking about, you know, uh, private, you know, conf confessions for life. Right, right, right. As opposed to these, right, right. Okay. We we're talking past public, each other. Public. Now, if it's in public, what one lawyer for the Liberal Party explained to me once is oftentimes when politicians make public apologies, they don't really mean it sincerely. They're just no, they don't. Diffuse it, right? Yeah. Which unfortunately, she made that at the same. She mentioned that in the context of Trudeau and his black story, his photos. Which and I said, wait a minute. If you're in the Liberal Party and you're a lawyer, you're telling me this. Do we really believe Trudeau when he's saying he thinks he knows now that this wasn't a good thing to do? But that's a whole other right. Image. Probably didn't think that one through when she shot her mouth off. But I, I mean, I know I've learned a lot just talking to you over the years, just hearing, hearing that perspective and, you know, having that person, the ability to ask questions. And so I hope, you know, other people watching this feel the same way 
that they feel like they're able to sort of understand the issues better, you know, don't have to agree 100%, just sort of understand where the root of some of these complaints, some of these, I hate to say sensitivities, but, you know, where some of these opinions come from, and even if you don't necessarily share the viewpoint, you can accept and understand the reasons why and be respectful to people that have a different frame. So Derwin, I want to, I want to thank you for coming on again. Uh, uh, plug your books, whatever else you want to say, whatever else we want to promote. I'll put like Amazon links and everything in the description box here, but have at it. Floor is yours. All right. Well, the books, uh, well, uh, still available on Amazon or finer bookstores as the old line used to be. Uh, the Dragon of the Stars, uh, co-edited by me and Eric Choi, uh, winner of the uh, Aurora Award for Best Related Work, and uh, Where the Stars Rise, um, co-edited by me and Lucas Law, winner of the Alberta Book Publishers Award for Best Speculative Fiction Book, and these are available on Amazon, and uh, if you look at my website, you can see uh, which, which stories I've published and uh, which other novels I have. Uh, uh, the, the Shrine of the Siren Stone and The Moon Under Her Feet are still available from Amazon from uh, Dark Helix Press in Toronto. The website is derwinmacsf.com? That's correct. All it's right. derwinmacsf.com. D-E-R-W-I-N-M-A-K-S-F.com. All right, everybody. You heard it. Check it out. Thanks, Derwin. All right. Thanks, Leanna. Thanks for inviting me.